Hello, and welcome to our new YouTube channel and to the first in the series of lectures celebrating the 75 years of um, Great Ormond Street Institute of Child Health. We're your hosts, Claire Smith and Dan Brayson, and we'll be here to help ask your questions at the end of the session um, that you've posted onto our Slido page with ICH 75 passed as the, um, as the code to enter on slido.com. So I'll just start the session by handing over to our director of the Institute, Professor Rosalind Smith. Thank you. Hello, and a very warm welcome to everybody who's attending this webinar. It's a huge pleasure for me to uh, be able to welcome you to this series, which was celebrating uh, 75 years of the Institute of Child Health. I've got a few housekeeping uh, things to mention before I introduce our distinguished uh, speaker for this lecture. So uh, our speaker will be uh, Professor Tim Cole. And at the end of Tim's talk, um, we'll ask you to log into Slido, www.slido.com, and use the event code, which is hash ICH75 past, uh, all one word, uh, to send a question or to endorse a question that's already been sent. And then uh, Claire and Dan are going to ask the questions at the end. We would also like to get to know a little bit more about you and who is watching. And to do that, we've set up a quick poll on the Slido page. So if you go there, enter the code hash ICH75 past, and then you can let us know who you are and leave any messages for us there. So this is our first live lecture in this series uh, to celebrate 75 years uh, of the Institute of Child Health. And over the next two weeks, we're going to be bringing you lectures from some of our esteemed colleagues uh, across our five um, research and teaching departments. And you can also find videos that some of our staff have made already to mark this occasion on the YouTube channel. We encourage you to have a look, subscribe to the channel, and to receive updates when new videos are released. So let me tell you a bit about Tim Coe, who I've known um, long before I came to the Institute of Child Health. Uh, he is a very distinguished medical statistician who worked, first of all, at the Dunn Nutrition Unit in Cambridge. And I was a research fellow uh, when Tim was there. And uh, he um, he's worked uh, following that. He came to the Institute of Child Health in 1999. Um, and he was an MRC uh, professor uh, of uh, medical statistics here. And what all of you um, who have children will know is that the red book and the growth charts in the red book, um, those growth charts were developed by Tim. So his contribution to child health has been absolutely immense. And a particular interest has been in growth assessment um, growth curve analysis, body size scaling, forensic age assessment. And so like all great medical statisticians, he has touched um, the lives of many clinical academics, the careers um, of many, and he has been an essential partner in a huge number of different studies, um, particularly around uh, child growth. He's published over 500 peer reviewed papers um, and he's been appointed as an honorary fellow of the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health and a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences. He's won a clutch of uh, distinguished awards. So in 2016, he was awarded the Rank Prize for Nutrition and the Royal Statistical Society's Bradford Hill Medal. Medal. And then in 2019, he was awarded the Tanner Memorial Medal for the Society for the Study of Human Biology. We, Tim, are very proud to have you as one of our own, to have provided the environment in which you have done this great work over the last 22 years. And we welcome you here today to showcase this work and to hear about your experiences uh, of working within the UCL Great Ormond Street Institute of Child Health. So over to you, Tim. Thank you very much, Ros. Um, let me share my screen. Is that 
Right, well, hello. Thank you very much again, Ros, for the very kind introduction. So this is my title, Time Past, 75 Years of the Institute of Child Health. It's a talk in two parts. First, I'll tell you a bit about the origins of the Institute of Child Health. And then secondly, I'll tell you some of the work I've been doing on the statistics of child growth. Now, the two halves of the talk both feature in the title in the sense that they both relate to time passing. The period of childhood can be thought of as a window in time. Now, children grow and when the window shuts, growth stops. So in that sense, childhood, growth and time all run in parallel. So pondering on that, let's carry on. So let's um, set the scene. The Institute of Child Health was founded in 1946, 75 years ago. Then um, 50 years on its 50th anniversary, it was renamed University College London Institute of Child Health, UCL, and that reflected it, uh, the two institutions merging. And then much more recently, it was renamed again, the UCL Great Ormond Street Institute of Child Health, uh, which reflects the fact that the Institute and Great Ormond Street Hospital work extremely closely together. Now, this is clearly rather a mouthful, and UCL GOS ICH is much simpler, and that's generally how it's known. So what does ICH do? Well, it uh, cl works closely with Great Ormond Street Hospital, that's GOSH, and it represents the largest concentration of children's health research in Europe. And its mission, this is all on its website, is to improve the health and well-being of children and the adults they'll become in three particular ways. The first is through world-class research, and I'll come back to that a bit later. Secondly, by education, that's to say by training students and junior researchers to become uh, world-class researchers in their own right. And third, public engagement. That's what I'm doing today, which is um, getting out there and telling the world about the great work that the Institute does. So where is ICH? Well, uh, here it is um, on 30 Guildford Street in Bloomsbury in London. And just to give you an idea, there's Great Ormond Street Hospital. It's in the same block. It's right next door and we're connected by a passage. So you can see Great Ormond Street there as well. Um, so that's where we are. But for me, the more interesting question is why are we there? Why, why is it there rather than any other part of London? And that relates to the other large area just north of Guildford Street called Coram Fields. And you might wonder why that what was there in the past. And here's a map from 150 years ago showing the Foundling Hospital based there. Uh, and the Foundling Hospital um, clearly predated the Institute, but um, the Hospital for Sick Children was there. That's what it was called then, Hospital for Sick Children. And um, uh, here's some more about it. So Coram Fields marks the site of the Foundling Hospital. You can see it there on the left. I've ringed where the Institute is now, just to put it in perspective. And on the right hand side there is a rather fine picture of the Institute soon after it was opened. And it was founded by a man called Thomas Coram in 1739. Now clearly it's all gone now. And in fact, all that's left is the Foundling Gate which is there on Guildford Street, just down the street from the Institute, a perpetual reminder of what was there before. So what is a foundling hospital and what are foundlings? Well, in the 18th century, uh, there was a considerable amount of poverty and young women, if they became pregnant, might well not be able to look after their baby and it would mean that they would have to abandon it and they might leave it under a hedgerow, as you see in the picture, or leave it in a doorway and these babies might be found or they might die. And if they were found, they were called foundlings. And the foundling hospital was set up to look after these babies, to take them in and care for them, bring them up and actually give them um, a, an occupation later on. 
Now, the word hospital in this sense is not like we mean hospital now. It means somewhere that provides hospitality. So the person that founded in the foundling hospital was Thomas Coram, who was a quite remarkable man. He was born 350 years ago in Lyme Regis. He became very successful in shipping and he sent, spent some time in the very young North America. And he came back, back to England and was living in Rotherhive. And when he went into London in his coach, he saw these foundlings and became extremely concerned about them. And so he lobbied King George II, and then King George II for help because he needed him to um, do the relevant charter. And he had to do this lobbying for 17 years. And anyway, he was finally successful and the foundling hospital opened in 1741. And it remained open for more than 200 years, the site on Guildford Street closed in 1926, but it moved. And over 25,000 children were supported there. And that explains why Coram Fields is so called. And also there is a children's charity called Coram again in his memory. Now, if you're interested in the foundling hospital and Thomas Coram, then do go along to the Foundling Museum, which is just around the corner from the Institute in Brunswick Square. Now, 90 years after the uh, Foundling Hospital started, the Hospital for Six Children was founded by Dr. Charles West, and that was at number 49 Ormond Street, not Great Ormond Street at that time. Um, and that was a townhouse, which clearly was very close to the Foundling Hospital. And certainly for me, it seems inevitable that it was there because there was the presence of a large number of young children um, needing care. Anyway, the hospital for sick children was set up as a voluntary hospital so that parents didn't have to pay to have their children looked after. And it had three aims. They were health care uh, and clinical research and nurse training. And start off with, it was extremely small. It was just Dr. West and a colleague and a surgeon, and they had just 10 beds in this townhouse. Well, of course, since then, the hospital for sick children has grown quite dramatically. So they were seeing many thousands of patients, even in the 19th century. And now, if you look on the website, you'll see that they have, they have 600 odd patients coming every day, 14 operating theatres, 50 odd operations a day. Um, you can see that the name of it has now become the formerly the Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children, and it is one of the world's best known and loved children's hospitals. So this leads us to the origins of the Institute of Child Health, and this is the idea of preventive paediatrics. Now, paediatrics is the branch of medicine that relates to children. Now, the hospital for sick children always provided curative medicine. It would cure sick children. But in 1941, this conversation was going on about the idea of preventive medicine, that if you could prevent children getting ill, then you didn't need to cure them. So 1941 was in the middle of the Second World War. It was a dark, dark time. And it was also by chance exactly 200 years after the, the opening of the Foundling Hospital. And there was this discussion that they should set up a school of preventive paediatrics somewhere in London. And the aim would be to teach those engaged in the prevention of disease. Now, interestingly, this was a group of nurses, health visitors, parents, nursery staff and GPs, I people who had um, exposure, as it were, to um, babies and children, not um, research scientists as such. So it's quite, um, quite interesting slant. And the on the right here is uh, a bit of the minutes from the very first meeting talking about the School of Paediatrics. And this was almost exactly 80 years ago in December 1941. And I've lifted that block from the minutes and Dr. Lightwood instanced the recent developments by the Toronto Children's Hospitals and of the extreme value this had been to the community there. So this is flagging two things, that the hospital is looking abroad for best practice as provided by the Toronto Children's Hospitals, and also that they are recognizing the benefit of preventive medicine to the community, the idea of public health. 
Well, the Institute was born, as it were, on the 1st of January 1946, and the director was um, Alan Moncrief, who was appointed to the chair, the professor of Nuffield, professor of child health. And with him, he had his dean, Dr. Wiley, and two assistants, Dr. Zillingworth and Bonham Carter. And this, like the hospital for sick children almost 100 years earlier, had very tiny premises to start with. It had some offices in um, the hospital, and it had 10 dedicated beds in a cubicle. But that was really all. Now, Alan Moncrief was really a remarkable man. He was at the Institute for 18 years, from 1946 to 1964. And during that time, he did an enormous amount. And I think one has to um, attribute to him the enormous success of the Institute since. He quickly set up these different programs for research and for teaching and for child welfare. He obtained funding for the uh, building on the right there, the province of Natal Child Welfare Centre. He persuaded the Nuffield Foundation, which had fun funded his professorship to fund a professor of surgery and also a neonatal research unit. He has established a department of growth and development, which um, has links with what uh, um, I'm be talking about it a bit later. And then he raised a public appeal to raise money to build a new ICH building on Guildford Street. And up till then hadn't been any um, building for the main institute. And that raised 500,000 pounds and he retired in 1964, just before the new building opened. And that was to allow the new uh, director a free reign in how they took the Institute forward. Now, in 1995, they celebrated 50 years of the Institute. This is a little bit of a curiosity because for an Institute founded in 1946, I'm unclear why they celebrated the anniversary in 1995. But uh, there you go. Anyway, there was one quote in there which was prescient. Together, we have the potential to become one of the best medical schools in the world. And this brings us to now, where we are with the statistics of um, ICH. So on the right is Professor Ros Smith. Um, again, thank you for your introduction, Ros. She has been director since 2012 and has been leading the Institute um, excellently in that time. And just to give you a scale of the operation, we've now, uh, roughly speaking, 560 staff, 75 professors, of which I should say four of them are professors of medical statistics, 150 principal investigators, that's to say senior researchers, um, 500 um, students, PhD and MSc, 200 pounds of um, million pounds of um, research funding currently, and 1,200 peer-reviewed papers published each year. Um, so, um, around 2018, a report was um, commissioned by the Institute to compare um, GOSH and ICH together with the other leading pediatric medical schools in the world. And this graph compares eight of these um, institutes, um, of which the pale blue is Toronto. So that is the Toronto Children's Hospital that we saw um, back in 1941, and then Melbourne and Paris, and then GOSH is dark blue up at the top. And this is a plot of the research papers published, and that's along the bottom of the graph here. And so there's between 2,000 and 10,000 papers published in this five-year period, 2012 to 16. So all of these outfits are really big hitters. They're producing thousands of papers in the five years. And then on this axis here, we're measuring impact. And impact is how often one's research papers are cited so one there indicates an average rate of citation and numbers above that indicate above average. And what we see is that of those eight institutes, two of them stand out in terms of impact. Melbourne is at the top and then GOSH ICH is second. And this provides clear evidence that GOSH ICH is 
um, a world leader in pediatric research. It is right up there. Right, so that was the Institute. And now this is me. This is a brief history of Tim. So I was born in 1946 in Sun Coalfield. And uh, in 1970, I married the lovely Angie Pick. Those are the two key life events um, in my early days. I went up to Cambridge University, planning to be an engineer, and I emerged from Oxford University as a medical statistician. Now, there is one other detail about my birthday. I was born on the 22nd of November. Now, those of you that are watching this live will recognise that today is the 22nd of November. Today is my 75th birthday. Yay! My birthday! Happy birthday! 75 years old! Happy birthday to me! Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Right, um, moving on, my brief history. Um, so in 1970, my career started, so that was 51 years ago. And um, as Ros said, I went to the Medical Research Council pneumoconiosis unit. That's to say the disease of coal miners, of dust on the lungs. And then in 1975, I went to the MRC Dunn Nutrition Unit in Cambridge. And, um, and during that time, my four children grew up and acquired partners. And then 1998, 1999, I came to the UCL Institute of Child Health, as it then was. And during that time, I acquired um, 10.5 grandchildren, as it were, it was in 2015. You note the half grandchild on the left in the tummy. And I'm pleased to say that she's since become a full grandchild. Um, so a question for you, what is it that children do that adults don't? And the answer is they grow. So what would be an obvious thing to study at an Institute of Child Health? And again, the answer would be child growth. And that is what I do. But in fact, there is a far better reason to assess child growth. And that's because it is really, really good at detecting whether or not children are ill. So as a general rule, children who are happy and healthy grow well, and children who are sick and or sad grow poorly. And so you just have to measure their height and their weight. And this gives you a very good idea about um, their state of health. And this is a much more potent indicator than is available for adults. So that's really useful. Now, I'm a statistician and I'm interested in statistics and child growth. And statistics is something that a lot of people have real problems with. It's a mathematical science concerned with data handling and it works with large data sets. And the problem that people have with it is that it involves variability, uncertainty, unpredictability. And the aim is to usefully summarize the data, but there is this problem, how is one going to do that, given the uncertainty? And so I've got a little example for you, and it's all related to pinball machines. On the left there, we have a picture of the Victorian game Bagatelle. In the middle is a pinball machine. And on the right, uh, for the younger listeners, is the wall a TV quiz game. And all of them involve balls rolling under gravity and bouncing off pins. Now, the Galton board, or Quinkins, was first described in 1873, and this involves a pile of balls stuck up at the top, which then roll down, bouncing off those pins and collect in those bins at the bottom, and you get that characteristic bell-shaped curve. Now, this is a more recent model of it, and you see all the balls or beads at the top just starting to fall through the pins and collecting at the bottom. And this is what they look like after they have all fallen through. Now it's actually fun to watch this in real time. So here we go. Now watch the bell curve grow at the bottom. Watch how it grows with time. There, isn't that amazing? 
So the important thing is that the data come out as a bell-shaped curve, which looks just like that. Now, ponder on this. If you'd taken any individual ball at the top of that before we set it running, you would have absolutely no idea where it was going to go. Its likely path is completely unknown. And yet you get this very clear pattern or distribution of fallen balls, which is entirely consistent. You could see as it grew that the bell-shaped curve retained its shape all the way through. And so that was in a sense entirely fixed. So we can say that we know we're going to get balls in the, uh, in the middle of the distribution, they're going to be common, and we know that they're going to be rare at the ends. Now, statisticians are really interested in distributions because they represent a powerful summary of and, and potentially large numbers of underlying data. And this particular distribution is very close to what's called a normal distribution. And I'll tell you, show you how we can use a normal distribution. So this is a normal distribution. And imagine now this is being applied to height. So if you have a group of children all of the same age and you arrange them in turn and you um, plot their distribution of height, you're going to get in like this with a few very short, a few very tall and quite a lot in the middle. So to make a useful statement about where they are in the distribution, we chop up the distribution into our 100 equal size regions. And we do that by drawing these 99 vertical lines, which are numbered at the bottom. And each of those are called centiles. And so we can say that an individual is sitting on a particular centile, say the 30th centile. Now, the other nice thing about that is that if you're on the 30th centile, then you can also say that 30% of children are shorter than you are. So the centile not only says where you are in the distribution, it also says how many children are shorter than you. So this shows 100 children, all of the same age, um, as they might appear. Um, so the shortest on the left and the tallest on the right, and you see that characteristic shape at the top that's um, showing how the height increases with increasing centile. And each of those corresponds to the centile curves. Now, when you use these centiles on growth charts, which is the way that one can describe uh, points on the distribution, in the UK, we use this set of nine centiles which are equally spaced and centered on the 50th centile and they extend from the, the bottom end half a centile so only 0.4 um, per, um, percent of children that's if you like 4.4 percent of all the balls that you saw piled up are below the 0.4 centile um, and there's similarly 0.4 percent above the upper tail of the distribution so this brings us to the Red Book. Now, the Red Book is the personal child health record, which is given to new parents, and they get it when their baby is just a few days old. And uh, it is um, full of useful information for new parents about how their child is going to grow and develop. It was introduced in 1993. Um, in 1995, some British 1990 growth charts were published, which I developed with uh, Professor Mike uh, Priest and Jenny Freeman, a PhD student. Um, then in 2009, new growth charts were introduced, which were based on the World Health Organization growth charts, but they were modified by, for the UK by an expert group that was led by uh, Professor Charlotte Wright. And just to give you a scale of this, there are upwards of 700,000 babies born each year in the UK. And this means that over the period of time of the Red Book, some 20 million plus Red Books have been issued, which is a fairly startling number. So what does a growth chart look like? So this is the growth chart for girls, age 0 to 2, for length. So along the bottom axis here, we have their age from 0 to 24 months. And on the, this axis, we've got their length from 44 to 98 centimetres. And then up the middle, we've got these centile curves, which tell us about the distribution at each age. 
Now, those are the numbers that correspond to each centile, which I showed you before. And there is the normal distribution that is represented by these centiles. And so at this end, the centiles are very close together and then they get wider apart. And the 50th centile in the middle gets increase, increases with age. And in broad terms, babies grow along these lines. So we can plot a baby there of four months and 62 centimeters. But then we might also see a child who, had, who was relatively short on a low centile or tall on a high centile. And then if we have two measurements, we can plot them and join them together and see how they're growing compared to the centiles. And that child is growing parallel to the centiles. This child is crossing down and this child's crossing up. So the growth chart provides um, a lot of information about whether your baby is tall or short and also whether it's growing faster or slower than average. Now that was height, but this is weight. Weight is more uh, tricky because it doesn't have normally distributed centiles. If we look here, those are the centiles that you see for height, which are symmetric. But for weight, I don't know if you can see that the tail to the right is longer than it is to the left. So there's skewness. And so that's represented on the centiles. So this tail is stretched upwards and you can see those centiles are further apart than those. Um, and to an extent there as well. And so one needs to be able to represent this skewness in the centiles. And this leads us to the question, how are we going to construct these growth charts? We've got to estimate the shapes of these centile curves to represent the underlying data. And so we need data from lots of children, many thousands potentially. And in the past, going back a long way, these centile curves were drawn by hand. But now people tend to use the LMS method, which I developed with Peter Green, uh, Professor Peter Green. And then we published that in 1992. I'm going to quickly show you a simplified version of the LMS method. So I've got a sample here of 4,000 girls, and each girl contributes a single weight measurement um, between 1 and 21 years. And what we want to do is to define the weight distribution at each age and produce those centile curves. No, these are a different set of centiles that are used um, elsewhere from the third up to the 97th centile. So the first thing we do is split the data into narrow age groups. So there's no age trend within a group. And then we summarize the skew weight distribution in each group. And we, use, we calculate some numbers, which I won't bore you with the details of. Um, skewness is measured by lambda, the Greek letter lambda. I should say mathematicians love using Greek letters because it doubles the number of letters that they can use in their formulae. And then the 50th centile, the value of the 50th centile is called mu. And then the variability, how wide the distribution is, is marked by sigma. And these three quantities, lambda, mu, and sigma, vary by age. And so what we can do then is plot the values of lambda, mu, and sigma against the mean age in each age group and draw smooth curves through them. So the top curve in green is the L curve showing the skewness. The middle curve is the M curve for mu, which shows how the 50th centile changes. And then the bottom curve is S for sigma, showing how the variability, the width of the distribution changes. And so this gives us LMS and hence the LMS method. Now, there's a nasty formula there showing how the values of L, M and S are combined to give the values for the individual centile curves. But because we know that the LMS curves are smooth because we've made them so, then we know that the centiles that we draw are also going to be smooth. Now I've checked and the LMS method has been used in 40 countries and it's been cited in 1800 on studies. So it's used very widely. And I should also say it was used by the World Health Organization when they constructed their growth standard. Okay, now I'm going to tell you um, about my second example, which is sitar. Now, you may know that sitar is an Indian musical instrument, and then there it's being played by Anushka Shankar. But it is also a form of growth curve analysis. And I first published this back in 2010 with my colleagues, Dr. Malcolm Donaldson, Professor Yoav Ben Shlomo, 
and uh, I will now explain it to you. I first need to explain to you what the growth curve is. And so since this is a historical talk, I'll tell you about the first published growth curve, which was published in 1777. It was um, a young man called Francois Goeno de Montbéard, who was born in 1759. So he was born about 20 years after the foundling hospital was opened. And the red curve on the left is his growth curve, and he's got multiple measure. He was measured um, up to four, nearly 40 times. So the, this is the key distinction between the LMS method and SITAR. The LMS method uses a single measurement from each individual. A growth curve involves multiple measurements from each individual. So there we have, here's the red curve on the left. Now on the right is the height velocity curve, which shows how fast he grows between each uh, set of measurements. So he grows very fast to start with him, slows down as he goes into mid childhood. And then he comes to his growth spurt and there is the peak at age 15, um, which is the pubertal growth spurt. And then after that, his growth falls to nothing as he reaches adult height. So the message from this is that growth is complicated. But it gets considerably more complicated when you look at multiple children, which is the particular interest that I would want. Um, so we've got lots of growth curves here. Uh, I omitted to say that I've dropped all the um, points from the growth curves to make them clear, easier to see. Um, so here we've got an apparently chaotic pattern. This looks a little bit, if you like, like the balls piled up on the Galton board at the beginning. The, all, there's no structure there at all. There's no obvious pattern. But what I'm going to show you is that actually there is a strong pattern, but it's hidden because of the difference in the heights of the individuals. So what we've got here is 12 girls, but this, I kept the number small so you can see what's going on, that it applies to hundreds or even thousands of individuals. But they differ in terms of their height and they differ in terms of the timing of their pubertal growth spurt. And actually the curves are all the same shape. And I'm gonna show this using mathematical ideas of translation and rotation. So what you need to do is to imagine each curve has been printed on card separately, and this card is then translated, that's to say it's moved up and down, left and right, and it's also rotated. So they're do I'm doing things with the card, card that one can do by just moving it about. Now here are the cards here, and the uh, curves are now being translated vertically. Now they're being translated horizontally, and now they're being rotated and there all the curves are sitting on top of each other. So the vertical translation plus the horizontal translation plus the rotation has led the curls all to be the same shape. So all the curves are the same shape. Now I think that's pretty magical, I don't know about you. What it also means is that you, I've demonstrated to you superimposition by translation and rotation. So all the curves have been made the same by translating and rotating them. And this gives the initial sitar, and that explains why this growth curve analysis is called sitar. Now I'm gonna look at it again, uh, but this time I'm going to track on the left-hand side what's happening to each individual growth curve. You see it's gone vertically up or down, it's gone left or right, and then it's gone back to the beginning. And this then gives us a triangle that represents the growth pattern for each individual. The triangle shows how the individual's curve differs from the average curve. So what we have here is, on, so on the left now, I've added the rotation to those triangles, so you can see they've been rotated. Now on the right are all the superimposed growth curves, and we can put some mean curve through them, the black line there, and it represents all of the curves, and therefore we can throw away the original data. And so what we're left with is a group summary, a mean curve on the right, and on the left, we have a set of individual patterns of growth and together they represent all the original growth curves. And therefore that represents a very substantial um, simplification. So what I've shown you is that SITAR takes a set of growth curves and then splits them up into a mean curve 
and a pattern for each individual. And this means that SITAR can do two different things. The first is it can compare mean curves between groups. And two examples here are randomized controlled trials where growth promoting agents are compared in one group with a, a placebo, that's to say a control, no, control treatment in the other arm. And oxandrolone, which is um, an anabolic steroid, is given to girls with Turner syndrome, that's a genetic disorder, and it's been shown to sitar shows that they are five centimeters, two inches taller if they are given at Oxandro, which is dramatic. In contrast, another randomized control trial looked at the effect of calcium supplement, another bone nutrient in Gambian boys. And here the effect was to make the boys grow faster, but it also meant that they stopped growing earlier and they ended up three centimeters shorter. So that was counterintuitive. Now, the second thing that SITAR can do is it can work with the individual growth patterns and compare those to the individual's later health. So this, if you like, relates to the uh, Institute's mission about the child and the adult they will become. And um, one example is a study which looked at the timing of puberty in individuals who had an early puberty, uh, we could show that their bone health in later life was better, they had stronger bones. Okay, so that's SITAR, and that's the end of my um, work and nearly the end of my talk. I'm just going to display some references which I mentioned in the talk, you don't need to read them, they'll be there on the YouTube. And that brings me to what I've spoken about. So I've told you about the origins of ICH, the Foundling Hospital, the Hospital for Sick Children, which became GOSH, the idea of preventive paediatrics and the fact that ICH is now a world leader. I told you about my research, the LMS method for growth charts and SITAR for growth curves. And I hope you've seen the common link between them. Both of them involve the passage of time, the growth and uh, operates through childhood and it stops when childhood stops. And finally, happy 75th birthday to ICH and to me, yay. Tim, that was wonderful. Thank you. And happy birthday from everybody. Oh, um, I, I can see um, lots of um, notifications coming onto our Slido, uh, wishing you a very happy birthday. And, uh, and that just reminds me to remind everybody that if you have any questions for Tim or Ros, um, then please submit them now on our Slido page, slido.com. And then you can enter the code hashtag ICH75 past and um, we will um, get to ask you some questions um, as soon as they uh, come in. Um, and one of the questions that's already come in, it says, what a fascinating presentation. You're clearly dedicated to your work and hence spending your 75th birthday with us. What's your favorite memory of your time at ICH? memory of my time at ICH. Well, it's, it's been wonderful working with all the people there. It's rather hard to pick out an individual moment. Um, I'm on the spot now. I've just been told by my wife that all, not all my slides worked, which is upsetting me a bit. Yeah, some of them um, were a bit, a bit delayed, but I think we got them all in the end. So they, they did um, I've um, individual papers I've enjoyed writing with individuals, but I think that's not terribly exciting to talk about. I think it's been the camaraderie of working with all my colleagues, uh, which is what I've enjoyed. Yeah, I think that I mean the interviews I've done, you know, um, with others as well. It's always seems to come back to the people here, um, and it being a very kind of open and collaborative place to work. Um, and yeah, everyone just like you know, you you presenting that lovely story of ICH, and um, it's it's about the you know the people coming together. So it's great. Um, let's just see if there's any other questions come on. Um, What, what do you enjoy most about your job, Tim? 
I like the challenge of being presented with a mass of data and knowing that somewhere inside there is a story. And I, if I'm careful and I do it right, I can tease that story out and I can then tell people about it. That's great. Thank you. Um, so I've got a question for, for Roz. Roz, are you video on? Are you there, Roz? Yeah, I'm here. Great, thank you. Um, so how has ICH changed in your tenure as director um, in terms of equality in particular, but anything that's really stood out for you of how it's changed since you've, you've been director? So ICH has been a fantastic uh, institute for a very long time, long before I arrived. Um, and the great thing about ICH is the people, as Tim has said, we are, we have so many really good people. There's good people everywhere, but there are so many here at the Institute of Child Health. Uh, and I think what we've been able to do, I hope, is to, to kind of really highlight and understand our strengths and perhaps be, be somewhat more focused on, on pursuing our strengths and then on pursuing our mission. Um, I, I think that, that that has changed somewhat in the last uh, few years, but it's always been a great institute and it always will be a great institute. Thanks. And um, Tim, how did you come to be at ICH rather than maybe at a different institution? Was it, how did, how did that come about? Okay, well, I was working at the MRC's Dunning Nutrition Unit in Cambridge. And our director retired and the new director came and uh, uh, to put it simply, I and my colleagues didn't see eye to eye with the new director. And it became clear on both sides that we uh, probably better not be working together. And um, at that time, so I was looking around what else I might do. And I already had links, this is during the 1990s, with the Institute. So I was working with Mike Priest on the British um, uh, 1990 growth chart. I was working with Chris Power in our department and her PhD student Julie Lake um, and uh, it just seemed an obvious thing to do to contact them and say was there a space for me there and um, so I did that and back came the answer okay so um, that was a no-brainer. Okay, um, so we're going to try something a bit different now. Um, we've got Dan Brayson, who's my co-host, and he's going to be finding someone to ask a question in person. Um, so testing the, 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 the oh, technology. Someone on the spot, yes. Yeah, Dan, are you there? We can't hear you, Dan. No, we can't hear you on mute. Sorry. Um, schoolboy error. Uh, sorry, thank you for your talk, Tim. It was uh, an absolute tour de force. It was fantastic. And of course, happy 75th birthday to you. Uh, thank you. Right, right here, I've got, um, I've got one of our research assistants who's been watching your talk and has a, is very keen to ask a, a question to you. So I'm going to introduce you to Matthew Siddle. So Matthew, if you'd like to ask your question. Oh. Hi, Tim. Uh, happy Hello, birthday. Matthew. <laughs> um, so my question was, how did you make or how did you come to make the transition between sort of bio and uh, mechanical engineering to biostatistics and what sort of informed that change? Um, well, it was serendipity again. I did my engineering degree um, at Cambridge. And at that time you could do the full degree in two years. You could do it in two or three years. This was a hangover, believe it or not, from the war, but I went up there. 20 years later, but it was a hangover. And it meant that you could, at the end of your second year, have a whole year in front of you with nothing to do. And so I chose, and you just have to fill your time effectively, and they give you a certificate of diligent study. And I did a course on um, industrial management, which included some statistics. And I rather enjoyed the statistics and my lecturer encouraged me to pursue it. And he'd been to Oxford, so I suggested I get there too, which I managed to do. And so that's what led me into that. And I've got a medical family, both my parents and my brother are medics. So the idea of doing medical statistics worked very well. Tim, I'll hand, hand back over to you, Claire, if that's okay. 
Yeah, great. Thank you. I've got a question on Slido from Professor Stephen Marks. It says, many thanks for an excellent talk, Tim. Yes. We're, now, yes. we're now having increasing obesity with increasing weight and BMI. How do we work out centiles for the next decade? Well, that's actually very simple. The short answer is we don't. Because if we work out new centiles, we will legitimise the current raised centiles of children. At the moment in the UK, we use centiles which I constructed back in, based on children in 1990. And so, for example, you have the 98th centile for BMI for body mass yes. index. Yes. And um, there ought to be 2% of children above the 98th centile. And as we all know, it's, the percentage is far, far higher than that. But if we now recalculate centiles using children now, well, then we will renormalize them and all the centiles will move up and you will then have 2% above the 98th centile, but that will won't really help us at all. We've, um, because it will pretend that we've solved the uh, uh, obesity problem. We have to work with a historical reference, um, which is the one that we've got. And only with using that can we document by how much our children have got fatter compared to like 30 years ago. That's great, thank you very much. Um, question for uh, Ros now. Uh, what's the, been the biggest challenge in your career? <laughs> Gosh. Um, well, the biggest the biggest challenge here, um, but it's working magnificently well now, has been to get the partnership with the hospital and with the charity really working well. Um, because we we all have an excellent relationship, you know, with the chief exec of the charity, chief exec of, of the hospital. But things come along that, you know, challenge us and may divide us. But to know that our success is so intimately dependent on each other. Um, and to know how important it is to work really, really hard to continue and to keep that partnership very strong. Um, you know, that's that's been something that uh, has been a high priority for me throughout my time. Great, thank you. Um, and I've just got one question uh, on the slider and then we'll go back to Dan for another kind of technical challenge. Um, so this one's from um, Helen Bedford. Are there any developments in digital growth charts, Tim? Um, I think Helen knows the answer to that, and, and the answer is yes, the, the Red Book is going digital, it's already started going digital, um, which I, I have slightly mixed feelings about, I think the idea of actually having a little booklet in your hand if you're a parent is a quite different experience from looking something up on your phone, but anyway, the, it's, it's the, way, the way the world is going, and so the EPCHR is out there and is being rolled out generally and um, it represents progress. And uh, so then people will be able to access their child's growth charts on their phone. Um, I think time will tell just how well that works, to be honest. I know as a, as a new parent, I was looking for the, the e-read book, you know, thinking that it, you know, should be an app or something like that. So um, I definitely would have welcomed, uh, you know, I think we look at our phone so much and it has so much data that I would have definitely gone for that if I if I you know was able it's to at the time. Being rolled out I understand I, I can't claim to be a uh, much of an authority on it. Great thanks. Um, so over to Dan. So Tim I've found another person to ask you a question. We're currently in the uh, winter garden of ICH which is a great oh, delight. I recognize it yes. No well quite well uh, but here I have Georgia who would like to ask you a question? Another Hi, Georgia. Hi, Tim. As a medical statistician myself, I was wondering what you might do next. What I might do next? What you might do next, yeah. Um, what am I working on doing next? Um, oh, yes, I'm trying to make it easier to switch between prevalence of obesity measured with the um, WHO reference and the IOTF um cutoffs that's a rather technical answer to a potentially rather technical question um which i 
probably won't. Well, I, no, I don't think I'll expand on that too much. No, that's that's what I'm currently working on, and it's proving to be rather problematic. But anyway, it's an interesting thing to. Um, try. Oh, thank you so much. Great, thanks a lot. I, th I think thanks, Dan. It looks like the technology works. We'll try and do it again tomorrow. Um, and yeah, just to, to sum up from that, and I'll pass over to Roz just to finish off. But um, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's a, it's the best way that you can support our public engagement activities at ICH. Um, and um, yeah, please join us again tomorrow for the second in our series of lectures um, for the present that time. But yeah, I'll hand over back to Roz and uh, to finish off. Thank you very much for joining us today. So Tim, um, you've given us a fantastic uh, start to this lecture series and I just want to thank you hugely for the history, for um, placing what we're doing now in the historical context, for telling us the highlights from your career, which have been uh, a fantastic contribution to the health and well-being of children and the adults they will become. And just to echo what's, what's really great as a paediatrician is that if you see a child's growing uh, as a paediatrician, you, you don't worry as much about that child as you might do if that was not the case. It's such a fantastic tool to have. Um, so, so, Tim, I hope you can enjoy the rest of the day and enjoy your birthday. You certainly uh, go to the rest of the day with huge... Um, wishes uh, all on the slider from the many many people who have enjoyed your talk and I'm very grateful to you for spending part of it with us uh, and we have benefited enormously. Uh, I want to give a, a flyer for tomorrow's lectures which are the present and they're going to be delivered by professors Manju Kurian and David Long so uh, let's see you again on the same channel at 2 p.m tomorrow. Um, but thanks to everybody uh, and thanks especially to Tim for everything that he has given to us in the last hour. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.